So first of all, just an introduction to the Australian rangelands because I have been involved in a project where we wanted to see if it was possible to roll out a monitoring program for biodiversity across the rangelands, um, meaning having to engage in the... Sorry? Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, where was I? Yeah. Um, it range stand in the middle. Is that right? No. <laughs> so the rangelands are hugely vast across Australia. Eighty-one percent of Australia. There's fifty-two of the eighty-five bioregions. It's massive. Extremely diverse in as far as climates go, landforms, vegetation. Huge number of uh, native species. Um, and many of those are restricted to our uh, rangeland systems. The interesting thing about the rangelands, compared to temperate and tropical areas, largely unmodified, um, and significant numbers of uh, um, threatened species. So this is just an overview of the rangelands. Um, quite massive. Most of my work I've done through the Mulgarans and lands and channel country, but I have been through to um, in the middle of Northern Territory and uh, New South Wales, but nothing in um, Western Australia. So I thought I'd better just get us all on the same page about when I'm talking about biodiversity, what that means, and I'm sorry, I'm standing in your way. Um, basically, it's the variety of life, the composition, structure and function across scales. So from microscopic to landscape scales. And Blair was talking, it, it was, it's good to follow Blair actually. They've bumped me in, the, um, in the, the roster for the agenda, but it was good to uh, follow Blair because he was talking about from site scale to landscape scale in their strategy. They're working at the landscape scale, but from a um, biodiversity point of view, it works across all those scales and temporally as well across time, especially in the rangelands, as all of you would be super aware of. Um, it also includes the natural processes, n uh, nutrient and water cycling, and um, all the different habitats within which species can occur. Pilbara, you probably already know this, is, a, is one of the 15 hotspots in Australia. Where I work in the Maranovanon is another one. So what is monitoring? It's basically repeated measures of um, elements uh, um, or indicators of biodiversity over time. And why, why do we want to do that? It's basically to track change. And there was um, somebody made that comment before about the importance of monitoring if, you're go if you want to provide evidence for what you're doing. Um, so, for example, um, I'm not sure if many of you are aware of John Wanowski's work. He, um, he's from the Northern Territory. He did a lot of long-term monitoring of mammal fauna in Kakadu National Park. All seemed fine, and then suddenly in 2008 there's a massive crash. And if they hadn't been monitoring, they wouldn't have been able to um, know that this massive crash in the mammal fauna was uh, going to happen. And, well, it has happened, but at least they've um, been able to understand that it's uh, what were the forces possibly driving that crash, uh, being fire frequency and cats, probably. Another reason why we want to monitor, I'm not sure if many of you here are very familiar with the grazing land management conceptual framework of the ABCD framework. Basically, it's um, the idea is for when you're monitoring your grazing land, you want your grazing land state to be in this A or B type condition. And there are indicators to help you um, identify what condition state your land might be in. It's a rolling ball. If it rolls down to B, you can get it back up to A very easy. Rolls down to C, it's a little bit harder to push to restore the land back up to B or A um, condition. What you don't want is it rolling down to D condition because then it can become extremely difficult, expensive, etc., to restore. I apply that same sort of conceptual framework to biodiversity because I think the same thing can happen for biodiversity. So you've got happy cows and happy geckos, unhappy cows, unhappy biodiversity down 
the bottom of the hill. Thanks, Pip. Another thing when I'm talking to pastoralists is that it's really hard to get your head around having to manage for grazing land as well as biodiversity because sometimes they seem to be uh, opposed. In the, we're lucky in the rangelands because we are working largely in relatively unmodified landscapes. So this is actual data from a lot of work we've done back east in the Maranoa and the Mulga lands, channel country. And largely you can see that we have a lot of alignment between our A class uh, and B class grazing land condition, meaning good condition for grazing land, and one or two condition for biodiversity. Where it, where it does oppose is usually in those modified landscapes, and I'll give you an example. This is Mitchell Grass Downs, it's naturally treeless. If it's managed for good grazing land condition, we find that the biodiversity condition is, is pretty good for it as well. However, and this is probably not going to be a, a, for, uh, relevant to you guys here, but um, next one, Pip. In the Maranoa area, we have a lot of um, conversion to buffalo grass pastures. And I don't know how all you feel about buffalo grass, but there's a very love hate relationship with buffalo grass back at, in the east. Um, and so this was a, a Brigolo woodland. It's been cleared and converted to a monoculture of buffalo grass. And uh, yeah, the biodiversity completely drops off. But even in this type of pasture land, you, there are still some things you can do to increase the biodiversity value. Leave a few trees, for example, or a couple of logs. So the fundamentals from our trialling rangeland monitoring across different properties, um, these are the things that we found that you really need to follow. You really need to clarify your needs for management. Is it for grazing? Is it for a particular type of grazing? Um, set clear objectives and questions and stick to those clear objectives and questions. Use a conceptual model and it can be as complicated or as simple as you like, but like the rolling ball conceptual model, that might be enough for your system of interest. Um, use a really clear sampling design stick to it as much as you can and have a set of indicators that will underpin your um, model of interest, your, ob uh, uh, your conceptual model and your objectives. Five, obviously a long-term commitment. You've got to stick to it because monitoring does, it is over time. And this is actually where government falls down all the time. Uh, regular checking and reporting, looking back at your data, um, making sure it makes sense to you. Be adaptive. Um, now, somebody last night we were talking about adaptive management, but and it's that's that same sort of idea. You, you take what you've learnt from your monitoring, you feed it back into your objectives. Your objectives might then change, and that's okay. It's it's all about just learning to um, make the monitoring. You don't have to be really stringent with what you do with your monitoring. Decide on criteria for effectiveness. So one criteria might be too expensive and you're not getting any bang for your buck. Scrap it. Or to then go back to your objectives and your needs and then decide if you can do it in a different way. Um, and this is another one that I talk to governments a lot about, but it probably works across any groups, is being collabor to collaborate and integrate. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah. So basically, to, um, just to summarise all that, clear questions for what you want out of your monitoring system. Be pragmatic. Ex the thing about biodiversity is it is expensive, um, it, or it can be expensive, and you need specific skills to look for certain elements of biodiversity. Um, you don't need to monitor everything everywhere. This comes back to your questions, being really qu clear about where you might want to monitor. Blair put up, for example, um, the spin effects um, uh, on, that was your most extensive type, the hammock grasslands, and, and most important for grazing. So maybe you just sort of focus on that land type, leave the others, or 
you might want to focus on the more restricted but highly biodiverse land types. Again, it comes back to your objectives. Um, yeah, friendly networks and collaborations, that's the only way you can get stuff done. Talking across neighbours. And from uh, that last point as well, and somebody brought it up in the question time, you need a driver, you need a champion, and that might be um, through your NRM group or through Greening Australia, but somebody who's going to stick in it with you and drive you. <laughs> so what to monitor? Um, this will depend on your objectives and, and your questions <coughs> for the, your monitoring program. But you can use this sort of framework to help you decide what you might want to monitor. So at the top of the, our inverted triangle, we've got landscape monitoring. In Queensland, we have quite, you, you're probably aware, we have quite a lot of uh, lands, uh, remote sensing tools that um, give us land cover map mapping, fire scar mapping, and I understand that this is going to start being rolled out across the Pilbara as well. Um, surveillance monitoring, this is the one that I'm in particularly interested in because that's a field-based monitoring sites where you, uh, it, it's across your, um, the, the, the area of interest for your property. Then there's targeted monitoring, um, which is very specifically for a particular species, for example, like northern coals, which might be of particular interest to you, or, or ghost bats. They're very localised in where they're found, they're very targeted and how you've got to look for them. Each of these types of scales of monitoring can feed into each other and form each other. Uh, yep. Oh yeah, so that's just an example of our ground cover mapping um, in Queensland. Field-based quadrats and trapping for northern coals. So the pressure state response, this is a very old EAG but sensible framework for deciding what, what uh, indicators you need to monitor. You need, your pre need to know your pressure. And this Blair uh, outlined some, some pressures like unsustainable grazing pressure, or it could be uh, fire frequency, or it could be uh, predation. Once you've decided uh, um, those pressures that you want to get indicators to measure that, that represent that pressure, um, you need to find something that's going to to monitor that change in state in response to that um, pressure. So for example, in a grazing system, it might be amount of grass cover. Your response then is how you've changed management to address what might be the issue coming out from measuring your state, and that feeds back to your pressure. So for example, yeah, pressure, fire, frequency, stock numbers, number of species for your state or bare ground percent. Doesn't have to be very difficult. Uh, response is to reduce stock, for example. Um, and then you keep your monitoring going to make sure that that's keeping on track. And of course, in the rangelands, we've got rainfall that drives pretty much everything. Um, and so that is like a fundamental thing to keep track of. So we've got our landscape scale and site-based um, monitoring type programs. Uh, like I mentioned, ground cover for your landscape scale, but at your site scale, it's more detailed information and uh, typically it's something that you can measure every three and five years. But again, it depends on what you're measuring. It might be more frequent or less frequent. So to give you the best bang for your buck at, that, at the site scale, um, we recommend that you use a, a boo versus average impacted type design, where boo means best on offer. It's your reference state. It's finding for a particular land type on your property or your tenure of interest that's in the best, off, uh, best condition that you, you think it can be. I mean, let's face it, everything's got a bit of disturbance over it in Australia. So. We've got to be pragmatic. We can't say, go find a pristine patch of something because it's not going to exist. So we call it best on offer. And then your average impact is just <coughs> chucking your site anywhere, which is just your average um, site in, in the paddock. Uh, yep. So for, uh, examples of booze versus average impacted in the Gibber Plains in the Simpson, Strzelecki. 
doesn't look much different, but there's, a, there's a, a variation in the species that you're picking up, increaser versus decreaser, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, spin effects, that's all, um, as Blair was saying before, very uh, much fire mediated and um, yeah, massive change in species depending on your, your um, boo or how managed it's been, how many, how many fires it's had. Another good thing about having your boo sites is that it will help standardise um, what's happening in response to natural phenomena like rainfall. So, for example, we had um, a whole bunch of sites in the Mulgolands. Um, nothing, bare ground everywhere, but after drought breaking rain, we had 60% more grass species coming back in our boo sites, but only 20% more coming back in the average impacted. So that we, that helped us realise that in those average impacted, perhaps they needed to be destocked a little bit, particularly during dry times. Uh, we'll skip that. So just getting onto the increase and decreases, and this is something that can come out of your monitoring if, when you start, and then when you get more information about what your species are doing, then you can actually use them as your indicators for monitoring. And I understand, um, I think Andrew Mitchell might be here. I came across this book and it's, he's already uh, got uh, listed a number of pastoral species by whether they're increases or decreases. They're really good indicators of how the condition of your um, grazing land is going. So decreases are those ones that are more sensitive to disturbance. So if it's a grazing system, overgrazing. Um, whereas increases, they are the ones that are not being browsed on perhaps, um, and they will increase as they benef benefit from habitat modification. And fauna do exactly the same thing. So I'll just run through some, um, oh yeah, this is just a schematic of what's happening. As there's management pressure, your decreases go down in abundance, um, whereas your increases increase in abundance. It's pretty simple. Uh, yeah, who, why do we care about them? Because they are really excellent indicators for um, good management for biodiversity and resilience in your system of interest. Um, the other thing is that, if we don't look after our decreases, they will eventually disappear from the system, as we've seen with bilbies. Um, so some examples of decreases, the, the good guys. Um, around here, I think it's your Barley Mitchell grass. Now, I'm not so sure what your increase or decrease of species are fauna-wise in the Pilbara, but back east, and, and you have these species here as well, um, the dwarf skeet, Manisha grayi, is um, very responsive to loss of cover. So it's a good indicator of decreaser. Little woodland birds like the chestnut rumped thornbill and the red capped robin, which is the next one. Um, very good indicators as, as well of loss of structure in a system. And super cute things like the striped faced dunarts, where they respond to, uh, if there's, uh, they're a good f fire indicator. Too much frequent fire and um, we've got an issue there. Increase of species, you probably already know about the Aristida. That's across Australia, I'm, they're known as increases. Yellow-throated miners, I haven't seen any here yet, but um, all the, of this family and the miner family are extremely aggressive. If you can pop the next slide. and that you tend to find them in more dysfunctional landscapes and, and habitat, um, and overgrazed areas or overburnt areas. Um, and they're very aggressive and they outcompete those smaller species like the little thornbills and, and um, wrens we were looking at before. So they're an excellent indicator. If you've got too many of those around, you won't have much of a bird fauna. Uh, mulga snakes, they increase that seem to be a good increase of species, particularly in response to increased water points and less cover. So the thing with long-term monitoring, it can provide the evidence um, that to show that you are managing well. And it will also give you early warning of um, a change in your condition state. Thank you.